Man, talking on StreamYard. Guy shit. Woo -woo. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Our resident Justin Trudeau lookalike, Ryan Stone. Kicking things, off. <laughs> kicking, <laughs> kicking things off with a song. There. How are you doing, guys? You all right? All right. Great. Now we're all here, right. aren't we? It's awesome. Fantastic. Fantastic. I've got a great panel of chaps uh, with me today. Obviously, uh, I'll go around. You know all these guys already, so we don't need to spend too long on the introductions. But the legend, Mr. John Fitch, uh, gro groggy Cappy, uh, Captain, Captain Sensible, Captain Capitalism. Uh, Aaron Clary, uh, Mr. Sterling Cooper is in the house. The world's favorite porn star is here again to join us for this wonderful conversation. Welcome, sir. And uh, well, the, the Trudeau look like himself, Mr. Ryan Stone. So, uh, <laughs> comment, and I'm never gonna live it down. Let me be so very dreamy. clear, Troy. He's just so well, dreamy. Well, it's the uh, you, you are growing the hair out a little bit, though, aren't you? Yeah. Unlike Rolo, I don't wear hats, so I can't just put on a beanie and hide it for the first year and a half. So I have to like figure out how to make it look like a mullet until I can grow it better. I want that like, wind actually, tunnel hair John that Fitch is, is longer going than on. me, though, isn't he? Yeah, so my hair is getting how long are you? Uh, ridiculous at this point. Down to about nose level now. We'll see. We'll see how long it lasts once it uh, gets warmer out. What's your plan, John? Though, are you going to keep growing it out and just sort of get to the wild man kind of? Yeah, I just get uh, a wild man right now. Yeah. See how it goes. Nice, nice. Looking forward to that. And Cappy, you look very uh, on the on the on the flip side. You look very um, clipped and businesslike yeah. now. Well, yeah, it's because it's short and it's easy to deal with. And my girlfriend's been cutting my hair now for like twelve years, and oh, really? I have saved oh yeah easily thousands of dollars. And she's gotten better over time. And the great thing about having a steady girl is you don't care what you look like especially <laughs> if she botches it up i'm like well you're the one that's got to look at me i don't care i just saved myself 15 bucks so <laughs> yeah but uh, now i also woke up and i'm on i'm over in las vegas so it's uh pacific time little nice. tired little tired what were you you out partying last night no out, no. out, out, out in encore no, diving into the swimming pool encore what, naked. no what happens is like i'm on central oh, time region. still so i come out here and i wake up at like 6 a.m so i'm i'm like yeah. an old man and i go get coffee with the old men and they all got their vietnam vet hats and all that and it's a it's a fun time but then i go to bed at like 8 39 and I, i'm kind of digging it it's all right exactly <laughs> good stuff good stuff and sterling cooper it's been a while since you've yeah. been on the show how are you mate I'm good, mate. I just um, I just got back from a whirlwind uh, trip in Colombia, and before and before that, I was on a whirlwind trip in Dubai. So uh, awesome. Yeah. Now I now I'm actually now I'm actually back at my own damn apartment. I can I can get back to work. <laughs> you gonna you gonna stay there for a while there, Sterling? Or are you going to jet off somewhere? Uh, look, I might have to jet off at the end of the month. We'll see. Um, are you likely to be there in May? Because Here I'm in Miami. Be yeah. Uh, Ooh, still up in, it's still, I'm still on short, still up in the air. Are you okay. coming out? Okay. Yeah, because I'm oh, doing yeah. the uh I'm doing Donovan's uh, gig. So yeah. Oh right, 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 right. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it should be pretty cool. Should be pretty cool. Troy, um, if you're doing that real quick, uh make the short flight from Miami to South Dakota and come visit mm -hmm. me. It's it's a very short flight. You'll enjoy it. Yeah, can do, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we should talk about that definitely. I mean, you know, I haven't got any concrete plans, but um I wanted to ask sterling a bit about columbia because i was just over there as well did you have well it looked like from the bits we saw you having a good time what what was what were your thoughts Mate, i fucking love that place uh <laughs> i'm not gonna lie it is it is awesome isn't it it is awesome it's, it's probably it's, better than south dakota i mean oh you haven't seen the women of walmart in south dakota they got, perkins, <laughs> they got a perkins there <laughs> they got I, three they if got I, three. Oh, if I have to choose where to take a, if I have to choose where to take this flight, is it going to be South Dakota, Columbia? I mean, Columbia. Go to yeah. <laughs> Look, no, the, I could, the, beef, the beef jerky. The beef jerky doesn't get you as far in Colombia. <laughs> um, but you were in Medellin, weren't you? With uh, yeah, with the yeah, I was in Medellin, yeah. Medellin for like a, a, a bit over a week. It's, nice. it's it's an interesting place, man. Like it's a, it's because I've been to a bunch of different South American countries and. I'd say, if I'm going to be honest, I'd probably say Rio de Janeiro is a bit like Brazil is a bit more dangerous than Colombia, yeah. well, from my impressions there at least. Uh, still had to kind of have my head on a swivel a little bit in Colombia, like not act like a dickhead, obviously, yeah. not walk yeah. around like you know with a flashy watch on and stuff like that. Uh, but like the people, people were generally really, really lovely, super friendly, super helpful. During the daytime, you got no problems, like. But and the the women, man, I got like. Oh. 
Jesus. Yeah, the women are, women are a lot of fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that that was like my that was that that photo I dropped in the group chat. That was on my birthday. That we had, <laughs> we had this big we had this big old party, and I, and I, act, I acted like a bit of a dickhead. And uh, wow. yeah, ended up ended up with like a foursome. So that's yeah, man. Happened. It looked it looked like a good time. It looked like a good time. I, I mean, like I haven't actually been to Medellin yet. I was over in Bogota, as, as, right. as you, you know, and um, it was just I mean, it was just awesome. But I'm going to be going back soon, and. Medellin's definitely on the list. The one thing I heard about Medellin, it probably didn't affect you guys, I would have thought, but I have heard that because Medellin is it is quite touristy, few like more sort of gringos there, more Americans there and stuff. Um the 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 non-Hispanic people don't have quite as much standout, perhaps, as uh as they would in Bogota or some of these other maybe places. Not, maybe not, maybe not, but like, yeah, they still like they still like a gringo. Yeah, 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 for sure. For yeah. sure, man. Awesome it's kind of, stuff. Kind of like, it's kind of like cheating. It's a bit. It's a bit like playing playing the game on easy mode in a in a weird way. It's like, it, yeah, it, it kind of hates you guys. You guys don't know the problems of being the Westerner that looks like a local. <laughs> I've had that in like a dozen <laughs> countries. It sucks. <laughs> <laughs> well, mate, you need to. Well, obviously, um, were your circumstances different, you should go to somewhere like. Uh, Poland or something like that because actually, they're... Korea. South Korea, <laughs> yeah, oh. North Korea, North Korea, actually. Eh, whatever, a win's a win. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But um, no, some, maybe somewhere where the, the you know, the, the contrast goes in the opposite direction, if you know what I mean. Like, oh, uh, so one of the Nordic countries. Maybe I'll go yeah, to Jack yeah. in, uh, in one of them Dutch countries. The well, ones where they speak that weird German <laughs> with the marbles in your mouth. <laughs> That's not marbles in Jack's mouth. Um, <laughs> hey <-o. Whoa. laughs> uh, I had asked Jack to come on the show today, actually, but he's not able to make it. I'm hopefully going to be doing a show with him later in the week. And I also asked Tusk, who's in Rio de Janeiro, if he wants oh, nice. to come on. And, and he's uh, he's also made his apologies today, but uh, he's, I don't know, doing some nonsense. Um, but we've got a sterling panel on today anyway. And the topic that I wanted to discuss really was how to figure out your passion in life. And the reason that I thought of that topic was because well, quite simply, because a lot of guys have asked me about it. It's, it's, and it's kind of, it seems like something that somebody shouldn't have to ask about because you know how we always say, follow your passion, follow your, follow, have a mission in life, follow that mission, put that in front of your relationships, all of that stuff. And, um, you know, or, or the old Rich Cooper, you know, do the work or, and chase excellence and things. But, um, then sometimes I've had people coming to me afterwards and say, well, that's all very well, but how do I know what my passion is? How do I know the thing that I'm throwing everything behind? And I mean, it, like, I, I guess for some people, for me personally, it, it wasn't something that I've ever really massively had to think about. But I guess for some people it kind of is. So I thought it'd be interesting for us to chat about it. I mean, John, obviously, as you know, your success in, in um, fighting and um, the UFC world, I mean, was... That would you describe that as your passion, presumably? But was that something that you always had all your life? It, it wasn't something. Well, I mean, that you fighting just didn't there. exist, you know. So I mean, growing up, my passion was was sports, obviously. But uh, you know, I wanted to be a professional football player. Yeah. Until I was probably you know my senior year of of, of high school football, I realized that I wasn't probably going anywhere. Hey, but Troy, I, I uh, de delete that real quick. Just long, real quick. Sorry you know, to interrupt. With, uh, What's up, oh, is that is that a that's a get get rid of them? That's right. not me. I'm not in the chat room. Sorry, go on there, Fitch. No, then I uh, um I started wrestling though at the same time that I started playing football, and I was just competitive at wrestling. So I kept going forward with wrestling because you know I was passionate about being physical and competing. You know, uh, it was kind of easy for me to find my passion, I guess, because. It was just whatever was the hardest physical thing I could find. You know, it was football and wrestling. And then um, I kept pushing with that. That took me through college. And, you know, I figured I would compete as long as I could. And then yeah. when, I, when I was done competing, I could um, I could teach. Yeah, yeah. You know, because I was, you know, so I, I kind of always liked competing. I always liked um always liked uh teaching you know because i've always been teaching my my teammates and other people along the way you know hel helping uh teammates figure things out and get things and do things better it was it was always a part of that so that that kind of came easy to me yeah 
Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the thing, because it seems to me that it sounds like from what you're saying, it was a pretty it, it sort of organic thing. It wasn't something that you had to sit down and think about and think, hmm, yeah. what's, what's my, you know. So, but it seems like for some people, they don't have that good fortune in a way. It seems yeah. like for some people, they do go well, through. I think it's particularly, especially for me, you know, it was kind of, um, you know, I just followed what I loved doing. And luckily, I was able to monetize it. <laughs> I think that's a big problem for a lot of guys is, is they love doing yeah. something, but they have no idea how to make money at it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, you're right. It's finding that sweet spot between the two things, isn't it? Because maybe something, maybe not everything you can necessarily make money from, or you can't make enough money from like if you're into crocheting or something, I mean, I don't know. I mean, you if, you could... got, if you know how to, if you know how to do sales and you can get in front of enough people, you can make money off of crocheting, you know? Yeah. Somebody, yeah. somebody does. Yeah, I think I think the main problem, and this applies to, I know we make fun of the girls about this, but this applies to men too, because this is what we tell people when they're younger. We tell 16 and 17 year old idiots, and that's what you are when you're 16 or 17 year old. You're all idiots. You don't know anything. Retarded. You know, follow your heart. Money will follow. Dream, live once. Don't do what you love. Won't work a day in your life. All that other poppycock. <clears throat> um, but if you tell people to do what they like, well, generally, we all have an agreement upon what it is that we like. And it's usually fun things like, oh, I'd like to be an author or I'd like to be a teacher or I'd like to be a porn star. <laughs> but only a few select people actually succeed in those endeavors. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. reason why is simple economics, you flood the market. You know, who doesn't like to be an author? Who doesn't want to be a, an actor or an actor? I remember, I think we're all old enough here to remember the 80s where, oh, yeah, go out to L.A. or New York and then you go beyond Broadway or stuff like that. Well, yeah. in, in telling people to do essentially what is fun, you basically damn them to a life of, of, of penury, uh, financial stress, and then forget what you want to do in life. You don't have the money to make rent. Yeah. And so I think there has to be a little bit more of a practical application where, okay, yeah, you see Sterling here, but and, and Sterling, I guarantee, is going to have an incredible story about how he ended up here. He didn't like wake up and hit puberty and one day, hey, I know what I want to do. I want to get paid to have sex. It wasn't that <laughs> path. I certainly didn't come here. Of all the reasons I'm here, I didn't set out to be this. I, I'm here because I wanted to teach ballroom dance classes on the side in part because I could use a little bit of extra cash during the nighttime and wanted to get laid. And now I'm mm. here writing, but it's, 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 a, it's so... I think it's a, a fool's errand, especially to ask young people, you know, oh, do what your pa how to discover your passion. You don't know and you won't know until you go out and, and, and explore a little bit as an adult. Yeah, exactly. I'll, I'll yeah. If you're not passionate right about something that you get good at, you're good at something and the passion develops from being good at it. Bingo. Like, dude, I can't yes. think back. Like, you know how you do the thing every five years, you look back and then you think, what I do then, what I do now. I can't look at a five year period in my life where I can look back five years past and think I'd be doing now what I did then. So if I, if somebody told me at 18 here, do this as your passion, they'd be messed up. I'm going to, I'm going to work on the language here. Effin, effin, Frenchly retard, <laughs> late, <laughs> late, like 2008 or 2003. I'm like, you know what I want to do? War on terrorists big. I'm going to join the military queen and country. 2008, like, I'm going to hunt terrorists. And then 2012, I'm like, you know what? Screw the military. This is a pain in the ass, and I hate being told what to do. And then 2005 or 2018, I'm like, I'm going to write a book. I'm going to do this. I'm going to work in corporate. I've done so many things mm. that there was no individual passion. The passion changes over time. Mm. So you can tell, like, Sterling right now, he probably still likes having sex, I'm assuming. <laughs> porn, there's porn, I bet you anything, and Sterling, you have to vouch me on this one if I'm right or not. And when you're doing porn, sometimes you're like, dude, this, I don't want to do this shoot. That's a bit of a slog. I don't want to wake up at four in the morning and have to like keep myself hard for 40 minutes because this person's not like those weird, like mundane office complaints, but you're having mm -hmm. it in the porn set. Yeah. <laughs> so well, it's before, like, yeah. And the people we... that hate cooking are chefs. <laughs> so it's like, he'll do something else. Now what he's doing is he's going around the world and talking about being a man, which none of us thought that was a thing. <laughs> That wasn't a thing. It well, still exactly. should be, but it's not. It is now, but whatever. Exactly. Before we go any further, could we just confirm, Aaron Clary, do you still like having sex? Yes. Yes, I do. 
That's a while. Good. On Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Right. So, um, so Sterling, obviously everyone's fascinated with, with your story for, for good reason. Um, I mean, it is the kind of job that it's, it's a dream job for a lot of people, as we've discussed before. I mean, did you wake up one day as a young guy and think I want to get paid for having sex or I mean, well, <laughs> um, look, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a case of, look, I'm not gonna lie. When I was a teenager, I thought like, Oh, this would be a fucking badass job when I was like 16 or whatever. But I didn't think it was ever going to happen, right? But it's, I got into this job, I didn't get into this job because I was passionate about it. I got into this job because I was good at it. Like, and there's, you need, people need to sit down and draw a Venn diagram of their life. And like, one circle is like all the things you're good at, all your skill sets, right? And the other one is all the things that you can make money from, like that people want, the services and skills that people actually want that are monetizable. And where those two circles overlap, where that, that, that Venn diagram, where that Venn diagram in the middle overlaps, that's the stuff you should pursue. Yes. There's no point in pursuing, like like the example we had before, if, you're, if you love crocheting, but no one wants to fucking pay you to crochet, for, <laughs> well, you're going to be broke and you're going to be living under a goddamn overpass. Right? Yeah. Just like all the failed actors and actresses that come to LA <laughs> who don't end up getting a job and end up on crack, they end up under the goddamn overpass. So this whole, this whole idea of like follow your passions, and I agree with Kathy when he says it's, it's, it's actually terrible fucking advice. Mm -hmm. Because once something starts, okay, two things will make you passionate. I guarantee two things will make you really passionate about something. One, making a ton of money from it. Yep. Will make you passionate. And two, changing people's lives and helping, genuinely helping people. <clears throat> that will make you really fucking passionate about something. You know, like I never, I never imagined I'd be doing YouTube. Mm. But it's mm. but it's waking up every day and seeing the, all the positive comments from guys whose lives I've changed keep like makes you want to keep doing this every single day. Like that's yes. that's where the passion comes from. I didn't have a passion for YouTube, but now I do now. Because, yes, because of what I'm able to do and bring and add to the world, you know. And the same and and, with, and Ryan's absolutely right with the porn stuff. Like <clears throat> there'd, there'd be days I'd be like, ah, like. Oh, I'm working with this bitch. Oh no, I don't want to fucking like. Oh, okay, I gotta get my dick sucked by her. Fine. Like, sometimes it will, like you will find the human, the human brain will adapt, no matter how good your circumstance is. You you, you will somehow find a way, unless you, you keep on top of it. You'll somehow find a way to like make even the most spectacular experience kind of like uh, normal. Your, your brain will normalize it if it gets it. Yeah. You know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, even on, even on a smaller scale, the uh, I did a lot of traveling over the last year, and that's sort of part of the the job, if you like. If the job, if we define the job as being somebody who makes online content, and you want to kind of try and make it a bit interesting, so you go to some different places and go, oh look, we're in Mexico, oh look, we're in Russia, or you know, not anymore, but you know, you know, um, <laughs> and uh, so, and. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry, Troy. I just that was, your timing on that was just brilliant. Yeah, but you, yeah, but you know, going to these different places and going, oh, look at look at this, look at this. It's it's part of the job, but of course, traveling in itself is not all fun and games, as we know, as we were talking about before we came on. You know, you've got to go through the, the scanners, you've got to take your shoes off. Now you've got to fill in 200 forms every time you go somewhere because of of the the big, you know. The disease um, and, and everything, although that seems to be sort of dropping off in a lot of places now. But um, there's all of these complications and annoyances and everything. So it's not like it's all fun. And like you said, it you get sort of acclimatized very quickly, I think, to something that before you might have thought, oh, that's my dream. Actually, when you do it, you're still the problem is we bring ourselves to everything, don't we? So if you're if whatever problems you've got, whatever hang ups, whatever challenges, issues you've got whether you're on a porn set or whether you're on a sunny beach in Mexico or whether you're at the greatest nightclub party in the world, you're still bringing that stuff with you and it doesn't take it away. Does it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I think does take it away a bit is when you're engaged in a, in a craft. And I mean, the thing that I've always been passionate about is, is writing. And I was always passionate about writing, even as a kid. So it wasn't something that, I then had, I reached the age of like 27 and I had to sit down and think, hmm, what passion should I pursue in life? It was just always something that I, lo I loved and I wanted to do. And do in doing this, I've managed to sort of but through sneak it in through the back door, if you like, because 
I obviously a lot of content is created through writing. I'm able to write books, etc. And sort of as an extension of that, now I'm doing this other type of content creating. I'm doing these, you know, videos, uh, YouTube, etc., which is kind of an extension. But the the key passion is still writing. But that was something that was always with me. So, isn't a good way for people to discover their passions to look back into maybe their really early life and think, okay, so what was I good at when I was a kid or what did I really want to do when I was a kid? And maybe that the answers are to be found there. I, I disagree. I mean, not to say that wouldn't help. <clears throat> it, it would, but I think uh, what is your passion is such a moving target and <clears throat> constantly changes, not only as you evolve and grow as a human being, but as we talked about your environment changes, like there was no YouTube 25 years ago you know that wasn't a thing we didn't we didn't think about that <clears throat> and what i've found uh especially in my life is that anytime i tried to do some quote i was passionate about or i thought I'd, I'd enjoy it ended up making me miserable not only because i didn't understand it as a young man what its true nature was but uh, uh sterling could talk about this even if you do find something that's fun and enjoyable the novelty wears off like i used to really thoroughly enjoy swing dancing and salsa dancing now i i don't ever care to do another step again uh mm -hmm. because i've done it so much and i think what people don't realize is <clears throat> as you grow as a, a young man or a woman become an old man old woman uh as the environment changes around you what is going to be fun and that's what i would recommend we do is we remove this word passion that's for delusional first worlders who come from the suburbs and have mom and dad pay for everything or the government like we don't have time for that if you want to do something that is fun that is going to change over time as you grow and your environment around you for example right now in ukraine probably eating food is pretty fun i think that's mm -hmm. everyone's passion right now or dodging bullets um, but what's going to be fun in Mendeline or what's going to be fun in South Dakota is going to, and, and whether you're 25, 35, 45, or 65, that's going to be different. So I would not, uh, I would be fluid. I would be adaptable when it comes to following your passions. And I, unless you are incredibly lucky and rare to make money off of it, <clears throat> I would not put your passions anywhere near in your career planning. And would instead approach your career very much as a, a lower level Maslow hierarchy of needs where I need to make money and a lot of it in a very short period of time. So I am liberated and free to go and pursue what are my real passions and hobbies in life. I got to say that uh, you'll be really surprised about what you get passionate about when you start getting a big fat check. <laughs> there's a lot of things that <laughs> you might not have thought you would have been that interested in that become really interesting once you get paid for it i think there's other there's other comment here from marlon uh this is the most recent one here once your passion becomes a job it's no longer a passion that's pretty good it's, it's pretty accurate uh statement there if i'm gonna be honest like because I, I remember when i first started in porn like the beginning of beginning of porn when I was working for all these smaller like hobby companies, like really, really low scale ones, it was a ton of fun. It was like, way more fun than working for the super, super like high end big companies. Cause that, then it was all business. Then it was all like meticulous and a lot more, it was a lot more involved in it. It kind of took away the, like the, the passion, if you will. Right. Cause it was like, okay, we've got, we've got these shots to cover. We've got these things to do. We've got this deadline, like all the money's on the line. Like your job's a lot more high pressure. So there is there is some truth in that statement you just made that once 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 you've taken if you even if you do manage to f pull off the miraculous and and make something that you you love a job okay well then once that transition happens all these other pressures are added to it you know and it, I mean, it just like just like like writing professionally like doing YouTube professionally like teaching professionally you you add all these different elements to it so. Not to say you don't enjoy it anymore, but it now is a job, you know. And people, people when people hear the word passion, they kind of the, the image they have in their mind is, oh, I just have fun all the time, and 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 nothing bad ever happens, and it's just happy fairy fairy tale land at the end of the rainbow, which is not the case. That's it's not, yeah. that's not how life works. Well, yeah, it's strange because there seems to be a dual nature to 
finding an activity pleasurable. So again, writing, and I mean, maybe Cappy or, or Ryan or, or any of you guys, you've got some, some insight into this. But for me personally, I always say, yeah, I love writing. I'm passionate about writing. Actually, a lot of the time I bloody hate writing. You know, I'm trying to write a bloody book at the moment, sitting down, trying to do my several thousand words a day. I'm like, Jesus Christ. And, yeah. you know, you'll procrastinate. You'll make any excuse to go up and walk into the other room or do whatever, right? Uh, so the yeah, actual, right. so in some ways, in some ways, the actual process is, is not pleasurable at all. It's actually quite painful. But on the other hand, occasionally you get into that flow state and that is quite pleasurable when you get into flow state and you kind of forget everything around you and it flows for a period of time. And that, and that bit's good. And the other thing that's good is when you get to the end of it and you've done it and then you've got a sense of achievement that, or, or even not, you've not completed the whole task, but even at the end of a good day's work, you can feel a sense of satisfaction in yourself for having done that bit of work successfully, if you if you know what I mean. So mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, does anybody else? I mean, Cappy, you you you're writing at the moment. Do you resonate yeah. with any of that? I, I do and don't in some regards because well, I'm a different person. Um, I absolutely detest and hate writing. Um, <clears throat> my goal is to have written more books than I've read for pleasure. Of course, you're forced to read books in school, so take those away. And I've I think I've succeeded at that. I hate English. <clears throat> I hate languages. I hate writing. Uh, it's just for whatever reason, the world thinks I'm good at it. Uh, but kind of like going to the gym or, or getting cardio, you hate doing the actual process and the work, but it's more the result that you're going for. And yeah, there's no better feeling than when you get that first physical cover of the book in your hand, like, ah, oh, I did this. This is progress. But that's more like, okay, I'm done with the the pain and tedium of writing and this chore <clears throat> and now and maybe i take a much more uh, mercenary view or, or economist view to it now i'm free to go do something because this book is going to generate income and i don't have to do anything anymore and so my my books um i would say i do enjoy doing the youtube <clears throat> and asshole consulting and, and podcasting certainly more because it's more interactive and that's more socializing but you know, when it comes to writing that is literally to make money Maybe help some people along the way too as a, a secondary goal so that I could go and enjoy my true passions, which are not money paying things. It's riding motorcycles, it's hiking, it's shooting guns. Um, so I, I, I make a clear distinction between pleasure and work. Uh, but I am also thankful that I can I can have a, a realm where YouTubing, being funny on the internet, that, that, that is one enjoyable. I get paid for it. But yeah, I think that is what the vast majority of people are going to face. Whether you even originally enjoy your job or not, you're, you're, the, the novelty will wear off. The, the law of diminishing returns will set in. You'll become familiar with it. And as Sterling pointed out, if you get good at it, it becomes more of a, a business. Like, for example, um, uh, several of you have been with, on Fresh and Fit's show. What I find fascinating um, is when I first went in there, this is over a year ago, it was that fun stage where, you know, where Sterling, you were with the, the small boutique firms and, and do, oh, yeah, let's sit, da, 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 da. Well, I went there no more than a month ago, and you could see how much more, not that they weren't professionals, but how professional they had to become mm -hmm. because they've had people pull guns on there. And then they got a, they have a, a metal detector. <clears throat> they got legal forms you got to sign. They have people mm -hmm. operating in the back. It's it's a business. It's a machine. Uh, they got their guy who gets all the women in line. Says, "Here's how it's going to be." Da, 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 da. It is a robotic assembly line business to a certain extent, and that's where you lose a little bit of the passion of the spirit and the soul, as opposed to when it was, "Hey, look at this funny, crazy, quirky thing we're doing." But that's everything. So I, again, I I would reiterate. Yes, Venn diagram. Yes, if you could find where we're both overlap, that's great. But I would really just focus on making money. Mm. business and pleasure separate and then have your passions be your passions because here the biggest empirical argument i could show against that um is look at every woman in our age and generation you know 40 plus who followed their passion of being a teacher or corporate exec they're all you think cheryl sandberg is happy does nancy Pelosi <laughs> ever smile these women are on top get hillary clinton they're on top of their game they followed their passion of being dictatorial quantas and and their power broker this <laughs> and that not a single one of them are happy not a single one i i care to be happy and enjoy my life so i would you know, come up. What do you want to do like in a year? Like what's your vacation going to be and what job gets you there most quickly? And what I think you'll find out is it's not just what pays most, 
but what is also allows you to be remotely in employed that you could do over the internet. And I think that's going to allow you to pursue your passions a lot more than, than making your job, your passion or vice versa. Yeah. I want to add to that as, as well and say like <clears throat> a big part of that is le leaning, leaning into your strengths, right? We're kind of taught in, in school and stuff to like, Oh, if you're, if you're bad at math, you need to focus more on, on, on getting better at math. Or if you're bad at writing, you need to focus more on getting better at English rather than, okay, well, my strengths are if you know, Troy, okay, well, his strengths are, are in English and, and the reading and writing process. So why not just double down on the thing you're actually naturally good at? Right. And John, he's a big, strong guy who's really good at punching people in the face. So why not double down on doing that and then learning how to teach it? Um, <clears throat> another thing I'll say there is that more time in math. <laughs> yeah, less time <laughs> focusing on the math class, more, more time focusing on the punching bag. The, you mentioned it before, Troy, this idea of like the flow state. There's something that this, the, the, I can't remember the, na the name of the book is Flow, but I can't remember the name of the author because it's this really long. Yeah, it's a poem. Hungarian, it's a Hungarian guy, isn't it? I can oh, never pronounce it. Yeah. Really hard yeah. to pronounce name for yeah. a Western. But the book is called Flow. And I think I recommend it. All you guys read that book. It's a fantastic book. But it talks about this, this idea of the flow state. And you mentioned it before, and that and that is actually a really good indicator of what you have energy for, and what you might be good at, and what you might be inclined to pursue. That could actually end up making you a ton of money, because if you can, if you can find a profession or a job which allows you to readily, constantly get into this flow state where time kind of ceases to exist, and you're just in this state of working, and it feels really good. It's kind of this balance between like this fine balance between pushing your comfort zone and where you're comfortable. Like your, your level of like competency is just being pushed enough. So you're not stressing out, but it's actually challenging and fun. And that's called the flow state. And that's where you, that's where you get your best work done. That's where you get, that's where you get the most reward for your work and finding jobs or finding, you know, a career where you can be in that flow state. Actually, I think there's a better kind of litmus test. For, for what you should be pursuing, but you'll probably end up making a ton of money out of it. Yeah, that's that's true. I mean, isn't the counter argument to what you guys are saying though, that if you, you know, like you could, a guy could probably make a ton of money by going into the city of London or going into Wall Street and working for a bank and, you know, uh, and, and doing all of that. And you could probably end up, you know, people make, you know, at, at a reasonably sort of lower to mid, end of it that you could make like half a million a year or whatever you could be making so you could be making millions a year doing that kind of job but what do you lose in the process you know you're working 70 hour weeks you're you know stressed out to hell you're doing boring work you're in that corporate grind the whole time so is it the counter argument to what everybody's saying sort of yes yes but the, the guys who are saying follow your passion are basically yeah. saying use have something that you're enjoying for the majority of your time rather than doing something you're not particularly enjoying for a large amount of time and then you know do you to know save up for that holiday troy do you know what i love about how you worded it it's the counter argument it's not the counter mm. action it's mm. counter argument and that's why i yeah. hate these arguments it's like well wouldn't it be better and you're getting this reddit tier guy who's making an argument hasn't done fuck all but for some reason knows enough about what you said and what you've done to tell you it's wrong mm. and then i realized like they don't know they think they know because, you know, most guys are 28 or whatever. I got it all figured out. I don't fucking know what I'm doing. That's why you get these power dads at 29 telling you how to raise kids. My kid's three weeks old. Let me tell you how fatherhood works. And you're just like, <laughs> fuck you, dude. <laughs> you clearly don't want to do anything. You just want to be told that you're super smart and you're right. And absolutely. And the trade offs with doing the stuff that, you know, Troy did that worked for him wouldn't work for you. So that way you never have to take a chance of doing something and finding out if it's right or wrong for you the hard way. And it's, I treat those the same way. We're like, well, those black pill guys are running me up. Like, fuck the flagpole. Fuck those guys. Look, you don't have to believe any of this stuff. John, Sterling, Aaron, Troy, everybody's saying, this is the shit I did. This is what I found worked for me. And we're noticing between the lot of us, we all have like, very specific things that are pretty standard between us. You hear most of us, it sounds like we're just reaffirming other stuff, but it's no, all of our experiences are converging onto some universal truths. The normalization of whatever your passion is, the fact that you become passionate after you're good at something, not before. The fact that what you liked will change over time and that's okay. 
like all of these things and they're just universal i don't want to say truths because that's too strong a word but i can't think of a better one it's like universal truths about what you're going to find about your passion and instead of taking that and understanding the message and applying it to your life in a way that makes sense instead of that you want to argue well fuck doesn't the guy in walls like <clears throat> fuck you <laughs> go watch the black pill migtow eight hour podcast about which content creator is more gay i'll give you a hint <laughs> They all are. All of us yeah. are. Still my favorite podcast. I enjoy man, those There's podcasts. nothing masculine about that. I'm done. I'm done. Man, <laughs> I'll, let me add something to, to what Ryan said, because I think it's the only other variable we really haven't, main variable we haven't talked about, and that is experimentation mm. uh, and just going out and trying different things. Mm. Uh, you know, someone, you know, Bill Burr or Seinfeld, one of these guys had to have gone to their first stand-up you know, open mic night. Uh, I had to go to my first open night dance class. Uh, Fitch had to go into the ring the first time and spar. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I don't know if we all knew exactly at that time if, if it would have been something we were really passionate about. <clears throat> um, and so I think that is the key thing to discovering what your passion is, is to figure it out. Because again, when you're 16 or 17, you're a moron and you're in a controlled environment <clears throat> where you're not really trying anything new. I mean, even the, yesterday it was, we went over on the west side place called Calico Basin where there's a lot of hiking. And what I was real impressed with is looking at all these younger 20-somethings, like we're talking late teens, early 20-something kids, uh, where they're doing rock climbing with chalk, like going inverted. It's, it's a pretty serious climbing. But what's most impressive is not their, their climbing, but when you get back to the parking lot after the hike, you looked at all the license plates. These kids were from, one was from New Jersey. And their vans or their, their cab trucks, these people were sleeping and camping. They came all the way out there to do that. They weren't in college. College is going on. These kids weren't in college. They weren't doing what they were told. They were like going and doing their thing. Now, admittedly, rock climbing and traveling across the country is fun. But those people are going to stand a better shot at finding what their true passions are and therefore having a much better and enjoyable life because they took the time to try it out. I got another kid who visited a couple days ago. He's 21, just turned 21. He chases tornadoes. And I look at these kids. I'm like, dang, they're so much further ahead than me because they're doing the things that they want. Now, of course, they live in vans and maybe they're not making a lot of money and maybe they got to bum a couple bucks or whatever. Uh, but they're still figuring out and assessing very quickly what they want to do in life in general, whether that's for fun or a career. Then all of us are like, oh, go to college. I'll oh, get your degree. Oh, well, just work really hard for the corporation. No, they're taking the time to say, screw mom and dad, screw the teachers, screw what the television tells me. I'm going to go out and do my thing. I think that's probably one of the best things you can do, whether it's traveling across the country to go rock climbing or just taking the time to take your local community ed class and see if you like pottery. That's way more uh, uh, to your benefit in the long term of finding out what your passions are than settling, you know, like, yep, this is what I'm in. And, and, and like, I like this as a 16 year old, so I'm going to become a scientist. No, you, you got to go out and find out what it is you like through trial and error. Mm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I, mean, I, I, I worked as a chemist. Like I went, I went to university, got my chemistry degree, thought that's what I wanted to do. Got maybe like six months into the career, and I was like, "God damn, this is depressing." Like, no one in this. There's no one. It, it yeah. was like the defining thing for me. There was no one in the in the lab who I wanted to be. Does that make <laughs> sense? Like, I walked it. I would yeah. go into that uh, that job every day. I'd look at all these depressed middle aged dudes, and I'm like, "Yeah." This you mean this podcast? Or are you you talking no, about chemical? Was, right? was, oh, okay. <laughs> all right. Okay. No, I was the same way when I did my when I did my student teaching. Uh, yeah, looking around and like being in the class, and I just realized that I did, I don't want to do this. This is not this is not my future. I don't want to do this for another 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. I, I'd rather. I decided then that uh, it was a better gamble to go fight people in a cage. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's important you figure that out too. Like I I made that mistake. I thought there was so, like it was bad luck that there was something wrong with me, and if I had just it wasn't even followed by instincts, but if I had looked and accepted that the first internship that I had was what banking and finance was like, I would have quit when I was 19 years old. Uh, and probably, uh, well, I certainly would have been on a different trajectory now. Maybe I would have been an engineer or something like that. Maybe I wouldn't have gone through the, the hell and all that wrote a book. Um, <clears throat> but you you also have to cut, look, know when to cut bait and, and move on. And I think that's mm -hmm. a huge time saving. Huge. Could save you deck, could save your entire life. Just says, you know, okay, this this girl's talking about 
whatever, uh, feminist theory and, and, and oppression or whatever else, cut bait. Same thing with your career. If you, even if you put your degree into it, if you walk around, look around like this isn't it, it go. It, it's time to leave. Well, we are joined by two guys who are both passionate and uh, successful. Uh, Mr. Paul Apex Mindset and Mr. John Modern Life Dating. How are you guys? I'm confused. Good. I'm confused with John Fitch's hairstyle. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> uh, John, you look like the Encino man. Um, no, I just wanted to give my I just want to give my two cents, and I'm I just it's date night, but I had to come in here and uh, say my piece. I just saw the Batman. It's really good. How is it? Is it good? I'm supposed it's to say it good. Like it. It's they're good. They're low key demonizing live streamers. The low key no. demon live streamers. I'll, we'll go into that later. But um, the title of this is is how to find your passion, right? I'm gonna give a very cappy uh, perspective on this. These I'll bloody this. kids, right, right. <laughs> uh, but but not from the middle class version, from the upper upper class. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> uh, no, but the bottom line is this, okay? For everybody talking about trying to find your passion, the reality is. It's very hard to do what you want to do for a living. And the only way you're going to figure this out for the, for the majority of the time, at least in my experience, is you actually need to get out there and provide a valuable skill to society and be able to financially sustain yourself and maintain yourself as a fully functional adult. Money muscles game frame, right? Have your money right. You're not you know, living paycheck to paycheck. You're not broke. You have a financial plan muscles you're in fit good shape you're taking care of yourself right uh game you know you have a fucking sex life dating life you're not a complete moron and then frame right you have good mental health you have all those four things lined up then you could understand from a baseline of where you are and once you're like operating and going through the the you know the in and outs of corporate work or your day-to-day -day work whatever once you start daydreaming about what you want to do after you have this baseline acquired, that is how you can monetize your passion. Your passion has to be monetizable. Otherwise, it's just a delusion. And so for me, I was an English teacher, and then I was working in corporate Japan and also corporate America. And I realized, like, this is not what I wanted to do. And I started off my first YouTube channel, 2000 and like not 10 11 or something like that and then i scrapped that and then i made the modern life dating thing and i rocked with that and a lot of people would say like oh mld just came on the scene and he was a success right off the right off the gate and it was not true at all man i failed i did youtube for three years in a row and i had 880 subscribers and it was very disheartening and it was just like if i just had a pair of tits I would fucking have like 30, 40, 50,000 subscribers by now, but I'm a man and where's my gender equality fucking movement, right? Anyway, so, <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. It's fucking true, though, man. It's so true. Even today, you like, would look better with tits. I agree. Yes. Yeah, yeah you would. You do want to fuck me, you weirdo. Anyways, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, what I'm trying to say is that get your ducks in a row first, and then you'll have the privilege of finding your passion in life because if you can't keep the lights on if you're worrying about what where your next dollar is coming from if you're you know more concerned about where your next bag of weed or bag of coke or mdma or where the fuck is coming from above taking care of yourself and having like a just a steady stable life you're not going to be able to find your passion you're going to have to have a fucking good baseline being being able to be sur like surviving and taking care of yourself and then You'll have the privilege of finding your passion. You're not entitled to it. There's a lot of work you have to do beforehand to actually get to the point where you actually are able to find your passion. And then if you could monetize it, then you're really, really special. And you're living life that most people will never live. Literally like 90% of people won't live that, if that. Yes, absolutely. But it seems, I mean, John, it seems like you've, well, it seems like you found your passion. But I mean, is mm. your passion, is it you being a YouTube personality or is it is it fundamentally helping people and you know the youtube and the way you reach your audience is just a you know is just part of the distribution of that i mean you and and john and paul see behind the scenes what i do in the coaching webinars that i've been doing consistently 
as now entering my third year. My passion is helping men, and it's a selfish one because you guys all know it's a fucking story. I go on my Batman origin story over and over and over again. Grew up without my dad. All I know was he was he got my mom pregnant, and then he died when I was 15, and I never met him. I had to teach myself to shave. I had to teach myself how to fucking tie my own tie. I had to teach myself how to fight. I had to teach myself how to build a fire. I had to teach myself how to go camping and shit. I had to forge my path of masculinity all on my own. And it was fucking filled with charlatans, scammers, people thinking they knew what the fuck they were doing. And they really didn't. So I wanted to pay it forward. And I just... I knew it was my passion because I always was trying to help my friends around me. I was always like, hey, will you just do this? Hey, if you just do this. But then I realized you can't help people who don't want to get help. So that's when I turned to YouTube and I started putting my message out and I started attracting people who wanted help. And we started building the community. And now yeah. here we are, you know, fucking coming up on 10,000 people plus strong global network. Uh, we're about to do a meetup event in Frankfurt, Germany in May. And so... Like, it's going to be awesome. I mean, it just keeps growing and growing and growing. The next hot dude con is going to be Frankfurt, Germany. Um, so, you know, I'm just looking forward to it. And I'm looking forward to continuing to grow this thing. But it all started by me having my shit in a row. And, um, yeah, like I said, helping guys out. I love it, man. I love it. And the thing is, when you help people, dude, I'm treated like a fucking celebrity. Any city I go to, I got a guy meet me at the airport with a gun in hand for protection and room and board prepared for me, car if need be, like whatever the case may be, I, I show up to any city in the world and I have somebody there that I can trust <laughs> to take care of me. Uh, 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 Jason's on the case already. <laughs> He's booked his flights. <laughs> he booked his flights just then when you were talking. Uh, I bet you he did. I bet he was you on did. Sky, he was on Sky Scout of booking. I, I um, hate to agree with John. I hate to compliment him because it goes against my life philosophy. <laughs> Um, but he nailed it right there. That, <laughs> you, <laughs> you, but he's right. It's it's a privilege to chase your passion because you got to support yeah. yourself. And I don't care. Let's say you got government welfare checks and you got a rich parents. Those people never had to work, let alone get to the philosophical epiphany. Realize, oh, maybe I ought to do something with my life. Uh, they, you're, you're never going to make it with having life on easy mode. But you got to support yourself. And have the extra free time then to go and pursue another passion, uh, thereby earning the right to pursue your passion. Because I was <clears throat> I was going to get in a sandwich the other day, and here I am driving down. I, I try and take a different philosophical approach to not get so angry. And here is a dude, black dude about 60. He had to be pushing 60, maybe mid-50s. And he's still doing the pants below his crotch thing. And he's, he's walking because he's fat and he can barely make it down there. And I'm looking at like, okay, fine. This guy probably cost me net tax dollars. But what have you, has your life been like for over half a century that you still think it's okay to have your pants below your crotch as a 58-year-old man? And then I kind of laugh at their misery and then how they just wasted their one precious life on this planet. But the larger point is that guy's never going to be in the position – to actually go pursue his passions. His passion is going down to the liquor store and grabbing booze maybe or something. I don't know what his passion, but it, it's it's not a real bad. And this guy has to constantly panhandle uh, to probably get some kind of Section 8 housing and <clears throat> some kind of government assistance just to live and get by. If you're in that – forget it. There's no reason – if you to give you the, the opposite or but yet within the same uh, group – you know, if you still have student loan debt and you're getting your doctorate in sociology because you're just too damn lazy to work and you just don't want to ever leave school, you don't want to work a real job, you're never going to be able to pursue your passion. You're forever going to be in financial debt and servitude because uh, you're never going to work the job or work up the money to pay off your debts you've accrued that you can't therefore pursue your passions. So boring as it is, <clears throat> financial discipline and not having debt and being able to have the time and money budget to pursue passions is a mandatory requirement. And that starts with you getting your financial act together. Very good. Yeah. 
Very good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who is jerking off your microphone? Gonna, gonna someone's gonna passion. make a great. Someone's gonna. This make makes great this makes Cappy me. so angry. I just do no, this. Right, right. He's he's been so mad about this like three shows in a row. You should Let's just, just do this every time he's on. Hi guys, Paul, how's Paul, it going? You, should, you yes. should stop trying to be a professional. Can I help you? And just get right into gay porn. Just you're just. <laughs> I'm doing you a favor. Well, he's he's, 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 he's being the navy for God's sake. Whoa, Ryan whoa, and I will whoa, do. Ryan and I got some shows to do together later on our new channel. Well, Paul, <laughs> let's talk about. Uh, Try, I'm leaving. Your, I love you. Let's talk about your passions, later, then. So, um, yeah. somebody's mentioned gay porn. I, I, I don't, I don't know if that's porn. one of them, but uh, but what's <laughs> but you, you've obviously you've had a varied you've had a varied career. Uh, from yeah. the military to what you're doing now, etc. So, so where do you sit on this whole like following your passion versus making money, but etc. thing? Yeah, yeah. Well, where I sit on it is it goes actually back to unplugging, and I've kind of had this message on a series of things that we've talked about. It's something that I come back to a lot because you know you a lot of people I think find themselves doing things that they think that they want because that has to do with the programming that they've been under or given. And then they find out or turn around that and realize that this isn't really what they want. You know, people go to college and get that job or, and get that family and nothing wrong with getting that family. If that's what you really want. Some people really want that, but they do what's in their programming. And then they turn around and realize that they've created a, a, a uh, prison for themselves to have to exist in. And so many guys who are watching this has sort of found that out for themselves. And then there's the other people who maybe they decide not to play and end up in that prison, but they're not doing anything right. They're on internet forums all day and video games and not they're checked out. You know what I mean? And they're making they they go from job to job and they can't figure themselves out either. So you have these different sort of extremes and it has to do with people not knowing really who they are in all this programming that's going on. What is your passion? Well, how do you know what that is? You, you know, if you don't know really kind of who you are in your own identity in a way that's unplugged from what everyone's been telling you and what everyone's telling you to do. And how do you know, you know, what's going to drive you? Because, I mean, the answer is, and I'll use, you know, Rich Cooper is my business coach still from Entrepreneurs and Cars. Awesome guy. Had simple but good advice was just to find that thing that you could get lost in and figure out the way to make money doing it. And, yeah, that's good advice. But, you know, how do you know what that is? So it's a process of unplugging, too. And trying out different things and, and figuring out what you really want. I mean, on my end of it, and I have that, you know, I have my, my alpha mindset course. You can go grab it, not to just plug it, but it's there. We do an identity, you know, some identity work really to try to figure out what your drives are. And what really, really what those, those passions might be in a way that's unplugged, you know, and not, not just being something that's based off of other influences, being able to separate kind of the influences from maybe what you really want. And then uh, another point of that is, so you're trying to unplug, you're trying to figure out who you are and what really drives you. Well, to recognize that that's a, a process too, and it's a journey. I've done so many different things because I started off on a pathway doing what I thought would be what would get me what I wanted but I hadn't really even sat down and analyzed what that is. What is it that I actually want? So you're just sort of reacting and surviving and going and doing things based off of programming. You know, I went to school based off of programming and not realizing or thinking about really what my options were. And there's nothing wrong. You know, I turned that into something good later, but you know, I had no idea what I was doing for a long time. Like most people, so I worked in business. I worked in different things, found myself unhappy in those things, which then made me search for something else. My, my, me joining the military and wanting to get into a fight, you know, was part of who I was. And I'd been ignoring that for a long time. So I ended up joining late, you know, and, and I'm glad I did that. That was a choice for me, but 
it's a choice that's not for everybody. You know, being a YouTuber is <laughs> an Instagram guy or whatever. I mean, that's not that's not a choice for everybody. You're even a choice for most people. You know, so you have to figure out what it is that you want. And that's why, like, in, when I do my stuff, I don't do ego marketing much. And I'm not slamming on people who do that. But it's like, I don't want people to try to be a, a, a version of me somehow. Like, I'm somehow something to, to, to try to be like. Because I'm not you, right? You have to figure out who you are and then be that version of you that you want to be. What does that lifestyle look like? Because it may be very different than what my lifestyle is. You know, and so that's another thing. Guys are on the internet trying to look for somebody to model after or emulate instead of figuring out who they are and what drives them. You know, yes. Having, you know what I mean? Having a Lambo and, you know, and, and uh, a bunch of cool Instagram photos and, and, and a couple of cool pictures of watches and some, and some broads. I mean, how much of that is real? How much of that's fake? It's on Instagram. Uh, is aspiring to be that, whatever that, that thing is, what is that? That's you being influenced again, programmed by this mar internet marketer, right? Or some business internet marketer telling you to grind it out and blah, 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 you know, to get what you want and pay. And then of course, buy us his course. Right. I mean, it's all, it's all people trying to just influence you to be something that will put money in their pockets rather than, helping you find out what really drives you. And so that's the thing is just to keep doing things and keep getting yourself out there and taking action. You're going to screw up. You're going to do the wrong answer sometimes and working towards finding out who you really are. And that may lead you into some niche or passion where you make a lot of money, or it may be a side hustle while you do something else to make money. But you'll figure it out in that formula if you just keep going. Um, one last uh, thing that I was going to say about it. I'm trying to remember what my last point was. But um, yeah, anyway, so <laughs> that that's it. You got to figure out who you are first. And I had another point. I'll, I'll think of it later. There you go. That's my take on it. <laughs> that is that is uh, interesting. It's uh, You raise an interesting thing there, actually, which I hadn't sort of thought to bring to the party, which is that people may think that their passion is a certain thing because they've seen a lot of influencers talking about it online. And so they then sort of take that on and they think, oh, well, my passion is I've got to become a multimillionaire and I've got to buy the proverbial Lambo and, and all the rest of it. And is, but is that really your passion or is that just something that you've seen other people doing and therefore you think that's what you should do? Yeah, that looks cool. Yeah, I remember my last point was to circulate yourself or surround yourself with people who will challenge your paradigm too. Because for a long time, my paradigm was that you, you kill yourself to make money and then you try to find things that make you happy outside of that. That work was work and then that's it. And maybe that's somebody's, you know, some the way somebody wants to operate, like their grind or whatever is kind of part of who they are and their passion. That's fine. But I found myself in, in jobs and vocations, like when I was running, you know, doing a real estate and running, helping to run a real estate team and, and all that stuff. I mean, I, I was making good money, but I wasn't, re I was grinding it out a lot. And, you know, 85 hour type, 90 hour type work weeks, a lot of times, and then trying to find, you know, ways to manage myself and, and find uh, happiness in between it. Not that I wasn't happy doing that work some of the time, but generally speaking, a lot of it was a grind. And now somebody else may be in the real estate world and, and that's their thing and they're killing it and it's intrinsically rewarding. But for me, it just wasn't. And so I had to be able to recognize that and know when to walk away from it to pursue what would actually be what I'm here on this earth to do to make a dent in the universe sort of thing. Right. And so, you know, sometimes people get into a sunk cost thing where they put a lot of effort into something and they find themselves, eh, it, I'm surviving on it. I'm doing well, but it's not that intrinsically rewarding for me or whatever. And, and they don't, they're afraid to make a move to do something else. And, you know, when you're around other people who've made those moves, who've given up things that were good to, to take risks, for example, and they know how to do it. They know what it looks like. They're living life in different ways on their terms. It's outside of your local social circle or your, hey, everybody goes to the same, 
you know, all my sales friends at the sales meeting, we all hang out after work and that's my social circle. All those people are in the same paradigm. They're in the same programming that you're in. So, you know, go meet with other people, make friends, other places, do other experiences with people who are really pursuing things in a different way. And you may not do the same thing they're doing, but what it does is it opens your mind to other possibilities and ideas that you never had before. So that was my other point there too. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. That's interesting. I suppose the fundamental question that I always come back to or the guys ask sometimes when I'm talking about this stuff is if you, if we're saying to guys, follow your mission and particularly in the dating space, right? Your mission should be more important than the women that you are, you are chasing after and, and, and so on, which I think, you know, makes a lot of sense. Right. But then what if the guy comes back and says, okay, but what is my mission? How do I know what to make my mission? What should no, we tell them? Just try something. Go fuck it up. It's fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Right? Right? Yeah. 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 There's part of that. I, I run guys through. It's it's kind of it's a little much to get involved in with a, a stream like this. But I run guys through an identity exercise that involves you know some meditation and mind clearing work to get their head clear and to look at and ask themselves a series of questions of what actually drives them and how they envision themselves. And I have these guys get into a, a state of mind where they're envisioning if they could wait, basically if they could wave a magic wand and there were no constraints within the realm of physics. Okay. They're not going to be, uh, you know, uh, the Hulk or uh, Captain America or something, but you know, in the realm of physics and reality, what is that best version of them look like? And what does that lifestyle look like? And so to picture themselves, whatever it is in that best version and then work backwards from there. So like for me, give an example, what caused me to move out of real estate. I didn't know that. I don't know why it never occurred to me because I had all this training and, and ex experience and also uh, passion for, you know, performance psychology and game too. But for some reason, my paradigm was that, you know, you don't make money off that stuff. You go grind it out doing something else. And so I was in that real estate thing. And then I started doing this identity exercise for my own self-development. And what I envisioned for myself was very different than the lifestyle I was moving towards in real estate, where real estate puts me in a geographic location, like the kind of thing, your lifestyle you're living is you're sort of the kind of big fish, little pond sort of thing, but in a local community. And doesn't mean, I don't mean that in a bad way, but you're, you know, you're chamber of commerce guy, you're going to ribbon cutting for a new business. You're, you're getting people in the community, very community oriented, you know, helps to be in a church helps that. And guess what? All that stuff is great, but it just wasn't how I envisioned what I wanted for my life. I wanted to be geographically independent was a big thing. And there were other goals I had. And so in recognizing what I envisioned as is what, would be the best version of me living the best life I could live. I realized that what I was moving towards to make money wasn't it. It wasn't po pointing me into that. And so that's what you want to do is you work backwards from how do I see my life? How is, what are my personal beliefs, values? How do I want to look and feel and be like every morning? I used to do a visualization exercise of what my mor Monday mornings would be like. In, in my best circumstance, you know, and you, in a productive way. What If I'm being productive and I'm, I'm doing something I really like, what does that Monday morning look like? And now my Monday morning looks like what I envisioned, you know, back in what, 2015, you know, 2016. Now I'm doing like literally living it out. And it's because it put me in a mindset of seeing opportunities then to be able to monetize, make money, into doing something where I'm making a dent, you know, cause that was part of it. I wanted to, I wanted to help people do better in some way, shape or form. You know, I wanted to, I wanted to be of service to people. That was a big thing for me is to be of service to others. And so it was just trying to figure out how to do that, monetize it, grow it. And, and it, it wasn't until a friend of mine, cause I had been the guy to go to, to talk about, um, and I've been a sales trainer too, been training people on kind of the performance psychology stuff for work. And then <laughs> helping guys out in their relationship issues. One a good friend of mine finally was like, dude, if you don't do this and figure out how to make money and do this crap, like this guy's on YouTube doing like 
dating coach guys and they suck. Like if you don't do this, I'm like, we're, I'm going to, I'm going to try to find a way to beat your ass. Like you're in trouble, man. Cause like you have to do this. This is your thing. <laughs> I, got, I got pushed into it by people. And I was like, really? All right, man, maybe I'll look, look into that, you know? So that was about back to those influences. But what really got me going and said, I would be a real estate guy right now. If I didn't do that identity work and figure out, man, what is it? I really want to live my life. Like, how do I imagine that? And then work backwards from there into my goals. Yeah. I don't know if that so, helps anybody, but yeah. So your friend, your friend, your friend said, there's a lot of, there's a lot of dating coaches online and they, and they suck. You must've seen my content, but um, that's <laughs> not at all. Not <laughs> that's at all. <laughs> Self-deprecating humor there guys. Don't, don't do that. Um, you were, you were a shadow band back then. You couldn't find you. Yeah, yeah, well, still, still am, mate. Still am, to be honest. Right. But, um, but yeah, no, that's really interesting. Just just out of interest on the visualization, would you recommend people doing that as a daily thing? Or how do you, yeah. I, maybe this is something that you teach in more detail. It, it is. And I can, I can give some detail on it. I mean, it, it's, um, there's breathing and stuff too that it, are backed in science and neurology. I, I'm not like a woo woo guy. Okay. Yeah. But um, it just does things to get your mind focused and to get you to really be able to picture I mean, think of it like this. We'll use an example of something really practical. So athletes use visualization to picture the game, you know, yeah. start to finish. John's not in his head because he's an athlete. He's he's a guy, the athlete. It's, you know, man, yeah, athlete over here knows what's up. Yes. You can, you can have your, you can get your body to have a, a similar to the exact same physiological response. Yes. Um, in real life is like going through the visualization. If you're picturing everything the right way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so now I have guys starting off with a logical experiment, more or less stream of consciousness writing and trying to, I try to pull them out of their programming and mm. have them get stuff on paper and stuff listed in a way where they're not restricting themselves or constraining themselves by limiting beliefs or ideas or programming that they've been handed. And just like to think more broadly, like, you know, I want to live off of a lake or I want to live off a body of water. I want to wake up at 10 in the morning and start work, or I want to start at five in the morning and go to the gym and then grind it out. That sounds really cool. Like some people like that stuff, you know, whatever yeah. it may be. And just sort of putting themselves out of the programming as much as they can by getting some things on paper and then developing that further and, and using visualization and breathing exercise to make that happen. And then they get into full visualizations of, becoming this person so actually embodying that best version guy right and feeling what it's like to be in state of being that guy and then a visualizing doing just like you would do in a sport just like i did as a military operator so i could you know get my idea of what it would be like to, to complete this mission before going on the mission right and so we, we even for everybody even at the most basic level uh, infantry guys, you do something called an actions on brief where you're going, okay, you, you're going to be here, you know, Hey, dickhead, you're going to make sure you feed him ammo. Hey, you're going to do this. Like, Oh yeah. And everyone's like this. And like you're the soldiers are instructed to, to really know their job and imagine that. So at a very logical level, we do this even just in, in like a military environment. So you're going to do that for yourself though. And imagine doing these different things. And then work backwards from there. Now you can challenge what you're doing every single day because most of what you're doing is a habit, right? Mm. Not even consciously aware. So now you're like, dude, I, I really want this lifestyle where I do this, but I'm doing all these dumb things, these things that don't fit that lifestyle. So time yeah. to start changing that. It actually, what it does is it makes you, when you really embody and know how to feel being, it sounds weird, but you're using your feels. You're feeling being this better version. What happens is now as you operate in the world, you get uncomfortable not being this person. So what normally happens is people are comfortable being this other version of themselves, the everyday version they are. And then to step outside of that to do something better, well, now that feels uncomfortable. This is where self-sabotage comes from. This is where it's hard for people to get motivated and they do all these things. And so instead of doing that, what you want to do is get uncomfortable being where you're at. So then you're like, Oh, I hate that I do this thing. And then you start looking into ways of fixing it or changing it. I ah, do this job sucks. It's not really what I want to do. And you start looking at 
ways of stepping into other other things. So that's that's kind of how you use it. That's the basics of it. Um, and I'm happy to give that away. I give everything away here that, that I can. You know, um, yeah. let's get more intense into it. Uh, that I have a whole. <clears throat> It's an it's an it's a it's like an hour and a half module, you know. I got to go through on, on the course, but yeah. yeah, it's good stuff. Yeah, no, awesome, awesome, man. And Ryan, I think you'd um, made a comment earlier if it was you and not a fake you talking about the fact that passion maybe is not the right word, and maybe we should talk more about motivation. Well, less about motivation. That's like you know the common thing. How do I get motivated to do this? And motivation's a feeling. Don't. I'd argue passion's kind of a feeling too. And the problem with feelings is that feelings are fickle. If you don't believe me, go talk to a girl and watch her cry over nothing. It's discipline. Yeah, but like, yeah, discipline, <clears throat> right? The passion. Do I have to, do you have to really, like, picture the guy who made millions of dollars running like a sewage disposal company? Do you think he's passionate about shit? Or do you think he <laughs> likes, he has a good life? You know, good life for his family and all that shit. Not really. Now, it's a benefit. Some guys do that where they're like, like Aaron, full time author. He's passionate about that, but even though he kind of hates writing, it's a means to an end. Mm. And I think the big problem is if you just follow your passion, you're going to do what everybody else tries to do. You're going to try and be TikTok famous. You're going to try and be a YouTube <clears throat> celebrity. And you're going to miss out on all of the unpassionate shit that gives you skill sets. Like, remember Scott Adams? He's normally wrong about everything, sucks about the divorce, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> But he did bring up a good point about talent stacks. And I actually kind of resonate with that. Like case in point, I went to university my first time as a teenager for graphic design. Didn't end up using it. Didn't be a graphic designer for more than like a couple of years. Joined the military, did a lot of information security and top secret shit there. Took that into the corporate world. Now it turns out the corporate guy who's able to handle information security, but I was also really good at presenting stuff to the board because the graphic design experience came in handy. Then I left that, and then I started doing some things on YouTube, where now not only do I know how to uh, like handle corporate culture, shit like that, resonate with people like do that, do my own graphic design, uh, filmography, I'm getting good at that now, but I was able to take the military discipline, and these things all kind of add up together. So am I passionate about making whaminate shit videos on YouTube? Not yes. really. Oh. <laughs> God damn right. Yes, but what, I am, what I do get some satisfaction for is that I can come on here and I'll make a video. But the video comes from my creative like art time in college where I can do some very nice visuals, some very nice graphic design to do the thumbnails. I take my ability to write coherently from the corporate time. I take the, the work ethic that I can be up at 630 in the morning making this content while some guys are sleeping in until two in the afternoon. And the passion comes from an amalgamation of all of those skills, but not a single one of those skills I was passionate about. Not one. Yeah. The thing that I'm passionate about hmm. is not being a piece of shit. And luckily <laughs> that no matter what I do, as long as I do it competently, I'll have a huge passion to continue not being a piece of shit, you know? Well, yes. sure. That's a reward, you know, but that's that, you know, I, you can start too from, how you see yourself, right? Oh yeah, like I'm not saying don't... I'm I've got the answer. I'm not saying this is the greatest answer. This is what's no, no. It's me. it's good though because see, you don't see you see yourself as not a piece of shit. It's part of how you see yourself. You well, see yourself I, I make, as <laughs> I, I like to think that other people not seeing it's kind of factors. Right? <laughs> right. Anthony Johnson right. thinks That's he's right. not a piece of shit, but I mean, look at him. Right. I think. Well, should we should we should we should we, should we do an, should we do an audience poll? Should we find out? <laughs> oh, dude, even the guys that like me in here are gonna call me a piece of shit. Never do yeah, polls. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but but yeah, but it's, but you know, it's 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 that's that's important, like too, because how you see yourself and what, like it's I see my morning going or how I see like, it's not like oh I'm doing like if you're doing TikTok videos thinking you're gonna be great somehow, um, you're following into I'd say someone's programming. You're seeing what's out there and what people are doing oh to be cool and famous. So you're like oh I'll do that to be cool and famous and you're just hitting your dopamine receptors but you're not getting nowhere right but like seeing like how how you see like not just what you're doing but who you are and all that <laughs> i'm passionate about not maybe i love it I get that. Uh, you see, you know, of the, of the but to add on to that too like exactly yeah. what paul's saying it's like yeah. to see who you are but mm -hmm. and here's the problem i find between guys oh, who have brain. like a narcissistic personality disorder kind of attitude towards it and people have oh, their yeah. shit together does the personality or does the identity come first or does the work that earns that identity come first? Well, you know, yeah, it goes, it, the dog. Like if you think I'm the yeah. president of the manosphere, never been in an election, it's a fucking right. deranged delusion. <clears throat> Meanwhile, sure. if you're like Paul did my work, 
you know, did this stuff, passionate about this, passionate about this. Now you can look at Paul and the, I, I don't know if you have like a word for your identity or not, but let's just call it Paulism. He's Paulism, <laughs> but he fucking earned it. Like Eight he didn't just start waking up one day at 17 years old saying, I'm going to yeah. be the Paulism. Right. No, it's a, it's a process though, you know, yeah, and exactly. that's, you, you want to, you see yourself doing, you know, doing something. I want to be this. I want to do this is what I think. And then you start doing the action towards it. And that's right. the other part of it. I mean, from the identity thing, there's a whole goals, like in that course I'm talking about, there's a whole goal section too, where you're actually setting and doing the right actions. What happens is though you, how you see yourself and how you want to live your life becomes the guide to the actual things that you do day to day, the actual actions. And some of those things are going to suck. You know, like if I want to make a million dollars a year in real estate, I'm going to have to do a lot of calls on leads, cold and warm leads. And I'm going to have to do some cold calling. I'm going to have to go on some appointments I don't like. You know, there's stuff, for example, you have to do. Even doing this stuff, I hate technology so much, can't even tell you. And I don't even <laughs> like social media that much. I and, But I have to learn it. And have to do it. I make myself do it because what I'm doing to contribute to the world here through what I'm doing is a driver. You know, just like what you said, Ryan, like what you're doing to contribute, though, is what makes you do women ain't shit videos, you know, like, but I mean, do something like, you know, go through the the the, the, the stuff of, you don't want to really do. It's not really that exciting, you know. And oh, yeah. it all yeah, adds I'm not up. laughing at those chick talks as nearly nah. as hard as it looks like on camera. <laughs> <laughs> he, he likes them really. Yeah. But the thing is, there, we all there, like them. <laughs> there is you can you can learn to love the grind to some extent, can't you? Without getting sort yeah. of Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk yeah, the about process. it. But yeah, mm -hmm. the, without getting sort of Gary Vaynerchuk about it, there even the boring bits you can learn to love in a in a way because they support the greater the greater goal. You know, well, you used to do that things. when you first started picked up. We talked about this like two years ago, where mm. the guys that are just about getting their nut. They always burn out in the pickup space, but you were more, and me too, were more addicted to the process. How do I get the best opener? How do I, I yeah. sabotage this yeah. and see how it works? And then you, Intrinsically you get rejected. Rewarding. It's just That's whatever. It. It's just a feedback thing. It's not mm -hmm. like a, they think I'm a piece of shit. I got to go <laughs> home, receive retention. Go, God. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you've got to fall in love with the process of everything, I think. And, um, you know, even, even the process, like we talked about writing before, I mean, writing theoretically is something that people are passionate about but actually it can be a grind and you've got to kind of fall in love with that haven't you you've got to just yeah. sit down and say, <clears> i have a very difficult time sitting down and writing yeah how have you how do you get through it because you because you've done a few books now haven't you a couple of books now i got a couple but it's been a while since the last time i, I tried to write now i'm mostly forcing myself to sit down and write tweets yeah. <laughs> yeah. Start, you got to start yeah, somewhere, well, man. It's a lot of energy. So. And even that, even that is hard enough, isn't it? To yeah, yeah. Because yeah, like... you're you're trying to write the same type of things, different ways, over and over and over again. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, it's tough. It's tough. By the way, anybody in the chat, if anyone's got any questions on this or anything else you want to ask about, put them in the chat because we're coming up to the end now, really. But um, if anybody wants to ask anything, we'll. Uh, we will address it before we go. Um, a few of the, the stars of the show have left early. So we had John MLD on earlier, who's had to go. We had Aaron Clary, who I think fell asleep. So he had to uh, had to go and take his afternoon nap. And uh, we had Sterling Cooper, who's probably had to go and fall in love with the grind of banging a hot chick uh, on, a, yep. on a porn set. So, uh, <laughs> so it's, I know. it's You've got to feel sorry for him, haven't you, really? I feel bad. Yeah, yeah. But... Um, Anything else on this topic then about passion? I think we've sort of taken it from all angles, haven't we? Really? It's a hard, it's a hard um, one. It's a hard one because, like, I, I I agree with everything Cappy says about being practical and don't waste your time following passions. But I'm I'm the result of the opposite. Yeah, you know, like I went head first into my passions at a very young age, and I was able to redirect as like opportunities opened up. You know, I could pivot. But like I never, I never really came off that. I'm, I'm gonna be a professional athlete. I'm gonna make money doing physical things, you know. Even though I went to college and had backup plans, and yeah, always, always had my uh, baseline necessities met. But yeah, I was a dreamer. <laughs> it's, it's a really tricky one, isn't it? It's a really tricky one. I, I think it's kind of like 
if you've got a passion and you're also good at it and there's some real world sort of thing. Well, there's got to be a level of success that you're yeah. I, because I was like passionate about things, but it wasn't like I sucked. It wasn't, a, yeah. I wasn't on the bench. You know, I was still, I was still playing, you know? Yeah. You yeah. weren't, you know, I was winning and succeeding and being praised and yes. Yeah. 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 So you were, if you, you were got, like, if you've got that passion, and... sorry, Paul, just yeah. so, if you've got yeah, that, pa- yeah. if you've got that passion, but, and, and there's also a chance of monetizing the, whatever the thing is you're passionate about and you're getting that real life feedback. Maybe that's a good time to think, all right, maybe I'm going to pursue this and see where I can take this. If you're passionate about something and you're shit or you're passionate about something and you're good and people are praising it, but there, it, there doesn't seem to be an easy way to monetize it. Then maybe then you're going to have to think, well, I'm going to kind of shelve that. And I'm going to go and work on something, something else and do that in my spare time. Yeah, I, I think I, I think I recognize early on that um, there's always jobs and teaching people sports related stuff. You know, there's always coaching jobs and positions. Yeah. And, and I, I, it's a part of, you know, part of, uh, being in team sports and wrestling and stuff like that is you have to coach a little bit, you know, you have to Mm. learn how to break things down and teach other people to do them. So it's built in a little bit and whether you're good at it or you're like it, you'll, you'll kind of fucking understand pretty early. So I always knew that whatever I chased, um, athletically, there was always, there's always a safety net, you know, I could always step back and start coaching. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, that's what you're doing is just, you're looking at the practical aspect of what you're doing. You're actually, you're putting your dream, so to speak, into a reality through goals and actions. And that's the difference, you know, whether or not you're going to, you know, be a, let's say a, 38 year old guy who's out of shape going, I always should have been a UFC fighter. You know, he's never mm-hmm. been in the gym once in his life. That's probably a problem. I wish you know, I would like have wrestled in junior high. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I, I get guys, I wish I would have joined the military. I should have. I was gonna, they always have a story and, and that's fine. I don't, not mad at him for it. Like it's whatever, but it's just like, you know, and I, my thought is like, who cares? Like, why do you have to join the military? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? It's because it's something I did. You need to do that shit. Do your own thing. But it's yeah. the point of, you know, figuring out who you are first and really, you know, you can have the vision and then you have to ask yourself creative questions. How do I achieve that vision? If someone sees themselves as a fighter, you know, and that's something that they always should have done, but never did it in their, let's say my age, you know, I'm 44 and they're, you know, haven't been doing anything like that. Well, maybe they're not giving up their family and job to go move to Brazil and live on a mat somewhere to try to be, you know, like a, you know, professional, like, you know, fighter and, and train it or a guy, uh, you know, for jujitsu. Maybe they are, but maybe they're not right. Maybe that's not what you need to do. Maybe just get, maybe just buying John's course and starting there. Right. And, and getting some training and then jumping in a gym and starting there, you know, that can be a start for doing stuff. And I know so many people who, Hey man, like the job I picked just sort of happened, but I really love jujitsu and I go and I train a bunch and that really, you know, or I really love golf or whatever. You don't have to monetize. If you can monetize your passion, great. Monetize something you're good at. But I mean, it's just about finding who you are and what fits your identity and then pursuing that and doing it in a practical way where there's an action plan, not in a uh, way where you're lost in some sort of fantasy land. You know yeah. what I mean? You got to read yeah. it in reality, right? So exactly, yeah, yeah, that's the key thing, isn't it? There was a couple of questions came through. So for Paul, somebody was saying, um, "When does your identity start? What age do parts of your identity start setting in?" Yeah, so it's it's going to be different for everybody. Um, and I'm not a developmental psychology expert, so take you can look some of these things on Google. But basically, when a kid starts off like a baby that baby doesn't have a separate identity from its caretakers or whoever's caring for them in that moment. It's kind of an important thing to recognize. And so they don't know how to separate themselves from their brain and emotional development isn't there yet. And then they're going through a process of figuring that out. They usually start to get more socially aware, like late in elementary school. Like you'll see elementary school kids are usually very accepting or not accepting just for whatever 
selfish motives they have at the moment. I want that toy. Ah, uh, well, no. You teach them to share, and they're like, okay, we both share the toy. <laughs> you know, some kid falls on the ground at six years old or five years old and has a meltdown, and then comes back to the classroom. Nobody cares. You know, like they're back at it. But then they start to become more socially aware, like later on. So, like, if a fifth grader falls down on the floor and has a meltdown, everyone's like, Ooh, that kid, you know, and then they, and they don't, then they ostracize them from the playground and all that. So they start to become aware of identity in groups and where, and then as they get into being a teenager, they start to rebel. This is where a teenage rebellion happens because they're trying to get their identity separate from parental identity. But as they rebel, they're now being influenced and programmed by other things as well. And so parents are like, gee, maybe I can point them towards an extracurricular activity or church or this. So that becomes a new set of program. Then it isn't it just, just mom and dad said so. You know what I mean? It's like, well, this identity I have. So like I was a martial arts guy growing up, actually. And the in the gym, the gym is what kept me off of, out of out of any kind of drugs and kept me out of crime because all my friends were criminals going up. And so literally like half my friend group has done time. You know, when I, from when I grew up. So, um, I, I mean, I stayed out of that cause I was training and then I was getting paid to teach, you know, to teach, you know, Taekwondo karate stuff and then teach, uh, boxing, kickboxing in the evenings kept me out of, you know, stealing from cars and doing the dumb things that these kids are doing to get in trouble. And so, right. That became my program and my influence. And then it just keeps going. And you sort of have an identity by the time you're emotionally and mentally mature, which is sometime between, you know, 18 and 24 years old, depending on your gender and your genetics. But you're always altering your identity based on what your thoughts, beliefs, morals are. I mean, some things can stay the same, but you can want to change and want something different. And give you an example, my identity. I'm no longer the same person I was when I was not doing Apex Mindset and just focused on military work, just mm. focused on, you know, tryouts. Like I think about going to, you know, selection or think about going to lure tryouts and stuff like or whatever and getting involved in that or getting that deployment. I was like the operator dude. I was a soldier dude. That was my identity. And now it's shifted a bit to more of a, I'm kind of a, I'm kind of a used to be that guy. Now I'm, you know, and, and John probably can relate. Like, John, when you were fighting for titles, your identity is a little different than now as a trainer. Oh, yeah. And as somebody it's been a still shift. Cool. I'm still adjusting, you know, mm -hmm. like not being an active competitor. Yeah. Like, yeah. So you're shifting uh, it. And the, the key is what I'm telling guys to do and I'm giving them practical exercises for, or you can sort of make them or mold them yourself if you want to or try to do some research, is to get control over it, though. You know, to, to use your visualization skills. And to try to get control, in, in other words, what do I really want? And do that thought problem with yourself. Take that time to yourself to mentally visualize it, think about it, journal it, and really sort of get into what it is that really motivates you. No one takes the time to just sit back and actually think about these things. And so if you do that, then it becomes intentional. You're not just doing the next thing because I guess this is what I do next. And then maybe you find yourself in a good place and maybe you don't, right? So like – if you're more intentional about it, you have better chances of going in a direction you would want, you know, and, and being happy about the results at the end of it. Mm, mm. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, look, we've been on for nearly 90 minutes now, so I think we need to bring it to a close uh, because these are busy gentlemen that you see before you. But uh, <laughs> let's just go around the panel. Let us know what you're up to, where the guys can find you, what you've got coming up, and, uh, and we'll close out. So let's kick off with John. Yo, uh, go to javish.net and sign up for the newsletter. And uh, you can DM me anytime on all my uh, social media platforms, book consultation, get some coaching, fitness, dating, fighting. I got you covered. Check you later. <laughs> Good stuff. Good stuff. And so let's move on to Mr. Stone. I'm taking next week off, but luckily for you guys, I got a work ethic. So the videos are in the can for the week. Watch some chick talks on Monday or Tuesday. I don't remember which day where I sit there laughing at Wabbit. Because they're so lame, <laughs> am I right? Occasionally I'll slip in something you can learn from. And then Thursday, midnight watches, mids watch. We can sit down and have the ASMR low-key talk about actual red pill shit, field reports, 
nuts and bolts of relationships shit. I love it. Hope you love it. It's got swank lo-fi killer beats so you can literally put it on and chill the night away so you're not listening to uh, the fuck's that goddamn frog and vampire account bitching about women all day. It's like, no, no, no. <laughs> and on top of that, I, yeah, the reason I'm taking the week off is because I'm going to go hide at Starbucks for a week and finally grind down the third draft of my second book because every time I write it, I end up taking the whole thing and like, I don't like it. So I condense every paragraph into the key sentence. And then I take all those sentences, expand it back into the book. And then I'm like, I still don't like it. And I third time doing that now. Now I'm staring at 500 sentences that I got to expand into a book again. And after this, I'm going to be done. So this is good. You get what you get. And Patreon, dude, I'm pushing it a little more now because, uh, I don't know, it's the, it's the most fun part of the day. It's literally the same type of field reports as Midwatch, but it's longitudinal over a guy's life. All these questions you guys got here, they're one-off questions, and they're great, and you learn from them. But imagine being able to do this over a period. Like, oh, I don't know what my passion is. Well, we break it down into steps. We actually find out what are the underlying issues for it. You actually sort out for a big part of it is guys finding out what it is they actually want, which it turns out almost nobody knows what they want. You kind of have to really break down the things they don't want. And so they have like a, a more manageable decision of what's left. So come on in there, do that. It's actually the perfect time because A, I don't charge till the end of the month. Or actually, wait, day is it today? Yeah, so that means you got like a couple weeks to see if you like it first. And are they're almost like graduating classes. The guys that are there now have been doing it for about six months. So it's not just me telling you guys what to do. There's going to be six months worth of guys who have already been there. They've done that. They've learned the lessons. They got the coffee mug. And so they kind of offer their bits too. So you're going to see all kinds of advice from guys who are doing it now, from guys who had done it before, and from guys like me who can remember 18 different articles from the last seven years of guys who have already done it and the lessons they learned. So check those things. I'll put some links in the chat and I'll stop wasting you guys' time bragging about how fucking awesome I am. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. Cheers, man. And uh, Mr. Mr. Paul Apex Mind, sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, if you, you know, just go to the channel Apex uh, Mindset on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. I got videos more consistently going out almost every day. Uh, you can count on probably three or four uh, a week, uh, usually a live stream or two, and then um, some little, sh you know, shorter ones uh, with little things in it. So that would help me out a lot. I mean, I have other things going on. If you want to do some work with me one on one, um, I have my mastermind group still in effect. We're doing really good work in that group. It's a lot of fun. Um, and you can check that out at apexmindset.net if you want a consultation or, or one of the packages or courses I got going on. It's all there. So that's it. Awesome stuff, man. Many thanks. And as far as I'm concerned, thanks everybody for joining me today. Thank you for tuning in. I have got a bunch of world-class videos going out next week on this very channel. So if you're not subscribed already, please subscribe. Please hit like. Please put a comment in the comment section below. It all helps with the lovely algorithm. Uh, as far as work is concerned, I'm actually writing a new book at the moment. I've just started sitting down and actually writing the damn thing. After a lot of procrastination, it's blood, sweat and tears, uh, but I am making progress, so there'll be more news on that soon. But in the meantime, get on my free email list. That is the link there. It's absolutely 100% free, always will be. I send out emails most days of the week, Monday to Friday. Sometimes I miss a day here and there, but in general, Monday to Friday, you'll get a free email straight to your inbox with a, a little article by me. Could be a piece of actionable advice about dating or relationships. It could be an anecdote. It could be behind the scenes information. It could be offers. It could be freebies. Free content, exclusive content going out most days of the week from me directly to you. And also, if you want to learn more about the wonderful arts of game and dating, then grab my collection of 11 books about that. those topics. Uh, it's called uh, Renegade Dating Blueprint. It's got such classics in there as uh, How to Be an Arsehole, uh, <laughs> Seven Laws of Seduction, uh, Still in the Game, and many more. Uh, I'm looking for the link now. Probably won't be able to find it, but it's in the chat somewhere. It will certainly be in the description below. So grab that while it's still at the low price of uh, only $39. That will be going up very soon, though. So get that ASAP. All right. Thanks ever so much, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, everybody, on the panel for a great show. Thank you, Troy, for having me. It's thank you, beautiful. and thank you, thank you, Rhinestone, for the quote of the uh, the quote of the episode officially. <laughs> <My life. laughs>
<laughs> which was what was it? Do you want to say it again to take us out? Oh, geez, I already got it on Twitter now. It's about being a piece I'm of passionate shit. About I'm passionate about not being a piece, piece of, shit. of shit. Exactly. So everybody watching, be passionate about not being a piece of shit. See you soon.